Kia ora tātou katoa. Uh, just before we start, I'm just going to open us with a karakia. Uh, so, kia inoi tato. Uh, let us bow our heads. Pray. Uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru. Whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi a ki ana te atakura. He tio, he huka, he hauhu. Tihei, Modi order. Kia ora everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, can you guys hear us okay? Awesome. Well, um, I'll start. So my name's Charm Skinner. Um, <coughs> I grew up in Kirikiriroa, which is Hamilton, um, and I finished my schooling there. I moved up here um, to study at the University of Auckland. Um, I'm currently in my final semester, and <coughs> I, um, I identify as she slash her, and a lot of the issues that I'm involved in pertain to Indigenous people's rights. Um, I do a lot of international uh, things in that world and there's just so many tenants to what I do so I'll keep it brief but i um, really excited to talk about the role of, of what, how rainbow issues intersect with climate justice tonight so there you go Tay, Kia take ora. it away. <laughs> Kia ora tato, uh, talofa lava, whakalofa lahi atu, kia orana, taloha ni. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're really excited to be talking to you about the intersection of rainbow rights and climate justice. Um, my name is Tane Polkinghorn. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm an Auckland boy. Uh, I grew up here, work here, um, uh, and my interests for, for a number of years now have been around the human rights of our rainbow communities, and uh, soon I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean when, when I say rainbow communities. Um, uh, yeah, wear a few hats, um, including with some of our community organizations and volunteering, and really excited to talk a little bit more about um, what we're here for tonight. So, kia ora, thanks. <clears throat> <coughs> so, uh, we want to make this as informal as possible, so we want it to be very interactive and not just us uh, talking at you. So like Maggie said before, uh, feel free to put any questions in the, in the chat and we'll be happy to answer. So shall we get this show on the road? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I think we'll start with is looking at the issue of climate change and framing, like setting our starting point that these are human rights issues that affect people. Mm -hmm. um, so what I mean by that is uh, climate change threatens the enjoyment of a wide range of our rights. So this includes the right to health, food, water, adequate housing and um, self-determination. So with climate change, um, it has the potential to impact those who are already um, marginalized and oppressed and in vulnerable situations. Um, yeah. Awesome. Maybe I'll give a <laughs> yeah. quick 101 of some of the terminology that we might be using tonight. Um, there are a number of different words and acronyms uh, to describe the diversity that we have in our world around sexual orientation and gender identity and sex characteristics. And just so we're all starting from the same page, I thought it would be useful to, to run through some of that quickly. Um, I'm sure you've heard of terms like the rainbow communities, LGBTI, LGBTIQ, um, variations on that, on that theme, um, perhaps SOGI issues, um, MVP FAF in the Pacific uh, realm, in the Pacific region. Um, sexual orientation is who we are attracted to. Um, so this can include identities such as LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and others including uh, queer, asexual, pansexual, and so on. Um, uh, gender identity is who we are. Uh, so that might be male, female, non-binary, gender diverse, and a number of other uh, identities that can be relevant to our cultures um, and, and where, we, where we are. So for example, Whakatapui here in Aotearoa, um, in the Pacific region, there are a number of different cultural terms um, 
some of them have been um, included in another acronym which I will run you through, MVPFAF, so M, Mahu in Hawaii, um, V, Whakasalewalewa in Fiji, uh, P, Palopa, Papua New Guinea, F, Fafafine in Samoa, A, Akabaine in the Cook Islands, uh, Whakaleiti or Leiti in Tonga, and uh, Whakafifine in Niue. Um, so many of these terms incorporate elements of our uh, culture and are just as much about cultural selfhood as they are gender roles in, in society. Um, the term I'm going to use tonight is rainbow communities. And when I say that, I mean the broad diversity of LGBT and I. Um, the I on the end of that refers to intersex, and this is about sex characteristics or biological and physical differences in our bodies. Um, and these can range from uh, variations in our hormones or our chromosomes or our internal or external reproductive organs and genitalia. So this is about uh, biological differences and um, having bodies which are more diverse than our stereotypical definitions of male and female. Um, so we've talked about sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics. And these, these concepts, they intertwine with each other, but they aren't, uh, they aren't the same. Um, so if you have more questions about that, really happy to answer them, but that's kind of a, a 101 level um, on some of the terms that we'll be talking about tonight. Cool. No, that was really helpful, uh, Tane. Um, I guess I'll do a 101 since I'll be talking about some Indigenous related issues. So um, some key documents that I suppose are really important to Māori Indigenous people of Aotearoa. Uh, first of all would be um, the Declaration of Independence, which is He Whakaputanga or Rangatiratanga or Nūtirini. So that's a really important document uh, for uh, Māori because essentially um, that document set out Māori sovereignty and authority to control ownership, not only over their lands, but uh, their own self-determination. So within that key document, it's upholding mana and tinoranga tiritanga. And what I mean by mana and tinoranga tiritanga, so mana is the authority and power that comes, um, that, that is vested in you. And I just want you to recognize that that is a very loose translation of the word. It doesn't encapsulate like the proper meaning of it, but loosely, uh, that's what that would mean. And tinoranga tiritanga uh, means self-determination. Um, and those are really important uh, terms to remember as we move forward in our kōrero, kōrero is to talk um, tonight. And um, tititi o waitangi. So tititi o waitangi is very important in, um, not just for Māori, but for Aotearoa as a whole. Um, and, and I say this is because this is um, the founding document of our country. Um, I think the two most, uh, my first point to acknowledge about Tititi is that there are two uh, versions. So there's the Treaty of Waitangi and there is Tititi or Waitangi. And it is important for us that when we are talking about Tititi or Waitangi, we say Tititi and not the treaty because the Treaty of Waitangi is the English version and Tanga Te Whenua is the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa uphold the Tititi version. Um, and so what I really want you to kind of um, think about um, is Tititi affirmed Māori the right to tino ranga tiritanga, self-determination. Um, and so this, well, I, uh, sorry, it was over their environment and their lands and their taonga. So taonga are precious things to us and it also gave us the right to our self-determination. And within that uh, document as well, um, we had to, we were given the right to look after those taonga. And that's a really important uh, concept to think about because um, tinoranga tiritanga meant that Māori, regardless of whether you're male or female, there was an obligation of everybody within the community to look after the environment. Mm. And that's really important because with the, um, with colonization, unfortunately the impacts of that, you know, broke down some of the ways that we 
um, operated and um, functioned in society. So, um, yeah, I just want you to kind of recognise that all of, all, there's a set intertidity or waitangi. Um, look at it as a human rights document as well, because there are a number of rights that are given to not only Māori, but they also give others that came to Aotearoa a place to stand tall in their tūranga waiwai. Um, and then another document that's really important to um, not only Māori, but Indigenous people around the world is the United Nations Declaration, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And that's a really um, important document. And I will maintain, we'll like send out a, um, like a link, some links later so you can look at those more in detail. Yeah. But essentially for us in Aotearoa, that document or that declaration is very important because it sets out the blueprint of how Tatiriti can be properly upheld within Aotearoa and it affirms Indigenous peoples the right to self-determination. Um, yeah, I think I have spoken a lot about that. Um, but what I did want to talk to you guys about is the sustainable development goals. So, sorry, I'm rustling my papers, but I just want to make sure that like I've, you know, got the, uh, the right things for you guys. So I'm not sure if anybody knows much about the um, sustainable development goals, but I'm just going to share with you what I know. Uh, so in 2015, the SDGs were established uh, by the UN in the 2030 Agenda. And um, essentially from that agenda, there are 17 SDGs, which seek to reduce inequalities, including poverty, health, and education. And they're really important because if you look at it in the international human rights field, they provide a framework of how states and communities all around the world um, can make changes to ensure that our climate and the prosperity of humanity are upheld um, to make sure that everybody is okay. Um, but I think while they are aspirational, we have to really look at uh, the voices that aren't captured within those goals. So um, I just really want to highlight the mahi that Stella Ivory has written on this. It's um, really draws out some of the key issues that affect uh, rainbow communities. So, uh, for example, um, when it comes to our rainbow communities, there is no specific reference in any of the 17 SDGs that relate specifically to our community. So, um, really, it contradicts the intended purpose of the SDGs, which is to include everybody and make sure that nobody is left behind. Mm -hmm. And because our communities are often already marginalized within society, it exacerbates um, the issues that we already face. So, you know, having something aspirational like the SDGs, it really, while it's got on one hand, it leaves our voices silent. And um, I think another way, like I was talking to you about the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, how can people self-determine their actions if they aren't even afforded their basic human rights before that? So this is a way for you to think about how climate justice affects our communities because we are vulnerable. And the other thing to think about is um, the SDGs aren't binding either. So states are expected to report voluntary on these actions uh, that they're taking in toward, towards, you know, um, carrying them out, but we have to remain critical and examine um, how these goals are going to be implemented and what checks and balances are gonna be made to ensuring that our voices are heard. So um, yes, again, while the SDGs are great, they leave our voices more vulnerable. And I think that'd be really good. Like Tane's got gonna to talk to you about um, our Pacific region and Sorry, everything's going off in this room right now. <laughs> um, yeah, but again, um, and another thing that I wanted to talk about is the core principles of the SDGs of, and slash 2030 agenda are around the people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. And again, it goes back to that issue of you don't consult with communities like the rainbow community or indigenous peoples, then how can any of those goals be achieved? And again, it's kind of like, because 
we are already having to fight for these spaces to have our voices heard. Um, it's almost like we're fighting like every other thing that's coming down on us. So, um, yeah. Do you like to quote it all more? <laughs> <laughs> uh, kia ora. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Charm, for that, for that rundown. Um, and we wanted to start our conversation tonight in that way um, to frame climate change and climate justice as a human rights issue. And so these are the, some of the major human rights frameworks that are relevant to um, the conversation that we're having tonight and possibly the conversations that you've been having in your other Freedom Challenge webinars um, leading up to this one. Um, I think at some point, um, Maggie might ask us a question <laughs> or, or shall I? I, well, I do. I've got a question, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it's from Alva, which is um, how could the SDGs implementation, uh, sorry, how could the SDGs uh, be implemented here in Aotearoa be improved? So I asked that question very badly, but how could the SDG implementation in Aotearoa be improved? Um, great question. Um, I think, first of all, it would be about ensuring that climate justice initiatives include and have spaces for rainbow communities to be a part of. Um, and I mean that right down to internally and externally to making sure that they have the ability to be able to share their issues in a safe space. Because again, if, if, if it's gonna be a space where it doesn't enable them to have their courted or heard, well, you know, it's kind of pointless. That's what I would argue. And I think it's really important um, that especially having, I don't like consultation, it's more about partnership, like being in partnership, being part of the dialogue and part of the decision making to ensure that the right thing is done in these situations. So, like for example, SDG 16, uh, that's peace, justice and strong institutions. So um, that's all um, in a nutshell. It is about the promote, promoting peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development and providing access to justice for all and building effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. And so I emphasize the point there that because many of our communities struggle to have that proper representation within these institutions, it's important when it comes to SDGs that we are included in that because otherwise, um, you know, it's just gonna be the same story where we're left out on the fringes and marginalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hope that kind of answers that question. That was great. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have anything further to add? Um, no, just to emphasise that what you talked about being involved um, through the design, delivery, evaluation processes is tinarangatiratanga. That is self determination. Is being mm -hmm. able. It, it's a fundamental human rights principle to be involved in the decisions which affect your lives, mm -hmm. regardless of who you are. And all people have the same human rights and freedoms, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity and expression or sex characteristics. So, it's important that we are named in those places and policies and spaces so that we are consulted and involved. Yeah, and I think there's a, um, you know, a real opportunity for us because in terms of the SDGs, they are very aspirational and mm -hmm. they have the potential to create and entice some real actual great environmental change, but it needs to include those who are vulnerable. And I think the issue that that goes back to again is participation. And so I think it requires us as a society to, um, almost kind of, I want to say, the decolonizing our minds because the ways that we, some of us in society function and how we think um, have caused us to think in a specific way. And I think it's about breaking down some of those preconceived notions to enable our peoples to be able to participate in these spaces because at the end of the day, we are all humans. We just are different and that's okay. But I think that's one of our... Um, biggest barriers is having to drag, break down those traditional concepts that um, unfortunately exist within our society and they range over a degree of different topics which that would be a long court at all for another night but um, participation is really important and it's about that equity and being at the table not like 
here's some little bits of the table. You have the full table and you're part of it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking as well in terms of um, Indigenous rights. Um, it's another issue that me and Tane have talked about as well is, you know, many of our rainbow <laughs> communities, some are Indigenous and so they face a lot more difficult things to face in life. So you might be living in poverty or you're already dealing with intergenerational trauma, being an Indigenous person and that is a really uh, difficult thing to deal with. And so in terms of self-determination in Tinoranga Tiritanga, if your rights aren't no not not if your rights aren't met um, as an indigenous person or your rainbow um, you know rights, it, your identities, aroha mai, um, it's really difficult. And so that's why I think it's really important to um, recognize that we all have a part to play in this. Um, you know, everybody's voice um, matters even if it's you share something or you write to somebody in parliament or it, it's every little bit helps to change all of these um, ideas that continue to impact on us in a negative way yeah and what is good for minorities is generally good for the majority as well so when we build our societies in an inclusive way in an accessible way then more people are going to be able to be involved. Yeah, and I think um, another thing that we need to be aware of, and this is like for everybody, a lot of our communities um, access international fora and forums because their rights aren't heard within their own states. So, you know, they exhaust their national um, options and so they look to the bigger, like, uh, human rights um, bodies and the UPRs and lots of, um, yeah, you get what I'm trying to say, lots of different forums. And so in terms of looking at this in a COVID-19 environment, mm -hmm. um, carrying on into next year or the year after when travel starts to, like when borders begin to open again and we go back to going and attending all of these forums, we have to be very mindful that how our rights are going to compete against the others. And I don't like to say that, but because it's already difficult for us to get those um, meetings or those different um, platforms to be able to engage and share and advocate for our rights, how do we fit into that as rainbow communities and how do we make sure that we aren't further, um, what's the word, Kane? Marginalised. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see yeah. some... Um, Look, there's a great question here. Can I read it out just so yes. you get some time to think about it? it it's from A, so Karawe. This is great. So one of my ongoing pakairo or questions is around how we engage with, encourage participation by marginalised communities and those on the edges of such groups. E.g. class states mean that many from the broader rainbow whānau communities aren't either part of this mahi as facilitators, policy, kaimahi, etc. So my question is round how do we, can we be, be more broadly inclusive? Who are you good? How about the focus group idea for Indigenous communities too? Also, what does inclusivity look like? How do we engage Rangatahi youth, uh, including those at school, class division? And there's a sorry there. I don't think there needs to be any sorry for that. What a great question. Do you want to start that one off? Um, <laughs> that's a million dollar question, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. a really great question. Um, yeah. Look, I think... Thank you. I'm, I'm going to speak from... Um, class division. I'm going to speak from my own experiences of um, my own hapu. Um, so I'm from Ngāti Wairere, and that's obviously in Kiri Kiri Roa. And um, a way, I think this is an ongoing discussion. It's not something that I can give you the, you know, specific example to right now. But um, for example, um, myself and some of my cousins have talked about, well, how do we involve our whānau more in these types of discussions? And um, and and I think it's very specific on your environment. Um, 
like for us, it's take everything back to the marae. And some of the problems that we face are because we're not home all the time and, you know, we work out of uh, kiri kiri roa. Um, it's about, I think, doing the best that you can. There's no specific blueprint as to how you can do this and include it. But I think as long as you're sharing the knowledge that you have with within you and you're giving that back to your whānau or the various communities that you're involved in, that in itself is a great way to keep facilitating that type of dialogue and corridor. And it's also very important because you're hearing from your community. So like we've heard from our whānau, we go back there and, you know, they ask us all of the questions that they literally have no idea about. Um, and I'm not using our corridor as an, um, an example, but there are some things that my cousins and I have been privileged to learn at university that the rest of our whānau don't have any idea about. And that's an obligation on us to um, share what we know. Um, I don't know if that is specifically answering your question, but like for myself and all of the spaces that I am in, so like Kane, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, sometimes I try to, you know, have corridors at university with um, Te Rāko Ture, which is our Māori Law Students Association. I try to have, you know, corridor about different issues and things that affect our rangatahi. And um, sorry, I'm just seeing your, is this the same person in the chat? Okay, that might be a different one. I'll have my, I'll carry on with answering this question. But I think it's about using the spaces that you have available to you to continue to open up um, more of that dialogue. Yeah. Awesome. Open-mindedness, eh? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so Tane, this is an extension of that next one, but I'd like, I think you could be well-placed to answer it. And then I've also... Um, got another question for you straight after but so this um, Alex is kind of an extension on the previous question but how could we work to provide spaces for rainbow community youth in the community outside of big cities Auckland Wellington Christchurch it is often very difficult to find these spaces for youth to engage within the community great question thanks Alex thanks Alex it absolutely is I agree with you so much there is a um, <clears throat> We, rainbow people tend to migrate to the larger cities and the larger centres, which means that we are um, more often, this is a generalisation of course, but are more often in those urban spaces rather than those rural ones. And I, uh, from, from the work that I do and the organisations and the people that I'm connected with, it certainly is difficult for those safe spaces to be found in more rural areas. Um, in terms of Schools, I don't know if, if that was the direction you were heading in, but um, schools, there are, there are lots that schools can do to be more inclusive to rainbow people. And likewise for um, environmental kind of uh, groups and, and activists and activism can do a lot as well to include rainbow people. And that's um, from, you know, really simple practical things like offering a non-gendered bathroom and making sure that, uh, communications and policies are inclusive of um, different sexual orientations, gender identities, uh, sex characteristics as well. Um, you know, the rights of, of our communities, Charm has already mentioned this, are often intersectional. And so there are other identities that we hold, like being tangata whenua or being disabled people or youth or older or whatever. We are never just one, uh, one thing. It's not that simple. Um, then, of course, we have the internet, which is a, a great place for many to connect with others like them. Um, it also comes with, you know, various downsides, as we're well aware of, um, and we only need to look at, you know, the, the justice that was served last week to, to um, think about that. Um, I think it's really difficult for, for folks in rural communities and education is a big part of that. Um, I think visibility is important, but that can also make people um, more, more vulnerable to danger. Um, the, oh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I've answered your question or if I've gone deep enough or not, not deep enough. Um, yeah, it's, it's, 
complex and it's frustrating and it shouldn't be this hard to be a rainbow person because um, you know the stigma and the discrimination and the violence that we face is not um, is not because of us being different it's because our society is set up in a very binary um, heteronormative kind of way that is actually very colonial thinking um, and you know if we're going to talk about the big C um, which which we will and I know you you will and you want to um, we have to consider the impacts of that on our modern day society because it wasn't just a singular event in the past it is an ongoing process and we see it in our uh, in terms of institutional racism in terms of everyday racism casual racism and um, in, in many other areas as well do you want to expand on that yeah, so I'll expand more on colonization and um, give a, a perspective from myself being a Māori uh, individual. And so I think colonization is a great way to really focus on these really hard hitting issues. So um, for example, um, colonization disrupted um, Māori society. So we operated as a collective people and we did things collectively. We looked after our whenua, which is the land. And as I said before, everybody had an obligation, uh, regardless of your gender identity, everybody had a job to look after that. And it, it worked in uh, conjunction with one another. So I'll give you an example. We uh, view the, the earth, we call Papatuanuku, and the sky is Ranginui. And they work together as one to ensure, you know, like with the rains from the skies, they bless our lands and make sure that there's prosperity there. And so uh, with colonization, um, it took away that collectivism. Um, it imposed um, these individual uh, notions of thinking. And I'll give an example of land. So land was for everybody. It, we didn't own the land because we were part of the land. and with the um, imposition of colonization, land became a commodity and it started to get sold off and through the various uh, laws that, uh, I, that's another corridor, which I will not go into because we'll be here for hours. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of our land loss uh, happened because of that. And then what happens when you take away something from a people's, if they can't live on the land, then how can they continue to be kaitiaki and look after that? So all of those ideas around our gender, gender um, they, you know, were disrupted because of colonization. And look, colonization for Māori affects us on a whole range of issues, but for tonight, focusing it back to climate justice, um, you know, our people were displaced. So I'll use my whānau for an example. Um, so my tribe was Ngāti Wairere, and where the main strip of Hamilton is now, Victoria Street, my people used to live all up there. Like we had one of our pars, it was called Kirikiriwa Pa. Mm. How ironic with the name, I know. <laughs> um, but it was a really, really big pa, and a lot of our family were there. And uh, what happened with the land wars um, in New Zealand is, you know, they, some of my family went to go and fight in the Rangariri land wars, and then we heard that the colonizers or you know the British were coming up the river and so my ancestor Hakupa Te Wahorua was left with this decision do I keep my people here or do we go somewhere else where we haven't been for years so that we still have our lives and so that's what they did they they went out to where we now are it's called we're in Gordonton but our new well, not new marae, but where we re-established ourselves um, is called Hukunui Marae. So that's where we are. But I use that as an example because we were displaced. And now there is a whole city that is literally built on top of our land. We don't have any of that left. And those, you know, it, it, the, the role of colonisation um, impacts us on so many levels. So it skews those, it's, it skews all of these the ways that we used to function. And um, I think that's really something quite important to talk about in this corridor, because how can, like, I don't know, I can't speak for every other Māori or hapu throughout Aotearoa, but how can we self-determine our 
own priorities when we don't even have whenua. And then again, um, like Tane was just saying before, add being um, rainbow to that, that's even more difficult. So all of these issues that continue to affect our land like and, cli and the climate are continuously affecting our people. So, yeah. Um, cool. Um, we have a question from Luca Lincoli. Thank you so much for sharing your question on the chat. So um, he says, Kirokoto or Kia or Ano, two people I have seen before, Koluka Toku Ingoa, I'm Tawiwi Fatama, someone gender sexuality divergent, um, autistic, very six, not intersex, female hearing sighted, um, and ambulatory song work on climate justice with specific climate warriors, Terafatu and Sualau Pule, Kambati and Rap uh, for this corridor. Thank you. And also, I have a question. I think partnership is great, and I am of the opinion, generally speaking, that we should explicitly be in documents and policies so that our needs as BIPOC, Rainbow, some of whom are disabled communities get addressed. But I also know and know of people who are afraid of being specifically named in documents as communities for fear of there being more overt violence with more overt presence in spaces such as these. What's your take on this? How do you engage with these complexities? Thank you, Luca. Bafatai, Luca, um, thank you for your question. I think um, my initial response is to think about using alternative pathways for participation because you're you're very right um, uh, increased visibility can mean increased discrimination and violence and marginalization and stigma um, I think uh, alternative ways to uh, to be counted can be one way forward um, for example meeting online versus in person um, meeting in uh, perhaps physical spaces that are other community centers. So it's not directly obvious what a meeting might be about if people are, are uh, attending in person. Um, those are some of my initial thoughts. Do you have further? <laughs> no, <laughs> no sorry, I've gone blank, guys, sorry. No, I'm human. <laughs> no, 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 you're doing great. Um, yeah, I, I would love to talk more about this and to learn more about this because um, it also plays into uh, privilege, um, the privilege that many of us have walking through the world. Um, and I certainly experience a lot of that as a, as a Pākehā trans man. Um, so I'm sort of at the top of the privilege pyramid um, and I'm very very conscious and aware of that and what is safe for me is not safe for many many other people um, including many trans people non-binary people intersex people as well as other minorities as well so um, just want to name that um, and and acknowledge that um, the privilege that I have in in many spaces can allow me to be safe to do things that is not the same for others Cool, thank you so much. And also I got a question before um, the webinar and that it's about what does it mean the intersection between rainbow rights and climate justice? You already spoke about this, but you just can um, emphasize this. Thank you. Thanks, David. This is actually a great question because I think it's an ongoing question. There's no set answer to that right now. Um, because um, as we've both already touched on, um, the issues that affect uh, the rainbow community are so entrenched within our society and in terms of climate justice, that's a whole big can of worms. And I think that conversation is something that's going to need to continue to carry on even after this corridor. Um, yeah, because it, it brings it back to the point where it's like, just continuously having to fight so many other fight for 
so many other basic human rights. So I think as we go forward and even like framing it back to the SDGs, like that's, these are supposed to be achieved by 2030. And um, I'm not saying that they're not going to be achieved. Like, you know, I'd like to be positive in this uh, kind of thinking, but I think it's an ongoing conversation um, that we can't give a direct answer to right now. In no way do I like to take the easy route out, but honestly, I, I don't have all the answers. And that's why I think it's important that, you know, me and Tane are sitting here right now and you guys have tuned in to, to listen to us, but it's also about you guys um, identifying things that you think um, are issues in this area and to continue to have that within your circles, your communities, and even, you know, um, the amnesty team and we're always contactable to continue this dialogue. So I think it's a definite work in progress and um, Something that I just I just thought of now was that because we are We're all different right, but we all are either part of a minority or even if we're not and we're coming here to learn You know us being all here all together is so important because it um, enables spaces safe spaces for us to continue to um, talk about these issues and not just talking about it, but you know, from the ground up, how does climate change, and I'm gonna bring it back to climate change, how does climate change affect those on the ground and tying those all back in together? So again, you can have people talk down to you from the top, but it comes from the ground up and that's what's really important to uh, reiterate in any of these conversations. Yeah, kia ora. I think um, if we go back to, to, to that question that, that David posed to us is um, uh, what, what on earth is the link between rainbow rights and climate justice and, and the kōrero that we've been having um, in the lead up to this has been that actually the two cannot be separated at all because those, um, those social and environmental issues are one and the same. Um, we were, we were just talking the other night about how um, we could try and summarise this talk into one sentence and that would be yeah. that it's all the same fight. It's all well, the same. It is because yeah. so many of the issues that cause climate um, change are issues that already face our communities. And so again, it's that question of, well, this is just an ongoing conversation because if, if any decision, and I mean like, in, in terms of climate change, like at a state level internationally, they need, we need to have spaces where we're included as part of the dialogue because if we're not, and, and we have seen this so many times where our communities aren't involved in these kinds of decision-making levels, it turns to crap and then we are continuously marginalized even more. So again, I reiterate, re reiterate the fact that it's um, important for all of us and I think for our younger generation and them coming up especially because I know that some schools will probably watch this mm. afterwards like having and expressing their voices like we need only look back to last year with the climate strikes the school climate strikes that happen you know our young people are telling the message around climate change and all of the other issues that are linked to climate change so I think it's about enabling them also the younger generation to be safe in these um, different forms to be able to express that and I think social media is a um, is a way that they can do that and I think activism has so many different uh, tenets of how people can advocate and um, make sure you know they have their five cents or I don't say sorry I'm going to take that back not five cents but there's ways that you can use your voice so I think um, it's, it's like meaningful participation, yeah, meaningful, eh? including in of our ways. young people. Yeah, yeah, I don't take it. because they're the ones that are going to be our future leaders, and we need to yeah. listen to them. <laughs> and I'm not saying people don't yeah. listen to them, but um, we have a lot to learn from from them. And but it's also that people at the top need to work with the people on the ground. And again, there's uh, this is stuff that is not new to people, but um, yeah. Kia ora, um, your name is A, so. I think it's a here yeah. leading now. Yeah. 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 Kia ora, yeah. 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 Can, can I just, uh, Alex has posed a question, but I'd just like to jump to, a, um, I went offline shortly uh, a while ago because I took a call from a young New Zealander 
who doesn't want to be identified is too scared to come on this call, which I find so sad. However, this person is asked and they're listening to the answer on my mobile phone. I'm at a Christian school, which doesn't really acknowledge rainbow rights. I, I'm rainbow and I have some friends who are rainbow. Can you help me? Love yes. some referrals here. How? Yes. Um, I don't know where this person is based, but I'd love to send through some details of, of organizations that can help. Um, Inside Out as well, we've just had a comment from A again. Um, they're based in Wellington, but their work is national. So is Rainbow Youth. They're based in Auckland, but their work is national. There are other organizations as well, depending on where you are. There's Wacky, uh, Waikato Queer Youth. There is Qtopia down in Christchurch. Um, I don't know what kind of rainbow you are, but if you're trans or non-binary or intersex, get in touch with Gender Minorities Aotearoa. I'll send through all of these links to you. If you're intersex, get in touch with the Intersex uh, Trust uh, Aotearoa in New Zealand, again, based in Wellington, but their work is national. Um, we have Outline, 0800 Outline. This is a free phone uh, peer support service that you can call if you want to speak to a rainbow peer. They're open every night from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And those phones are answered by trained volunteers um, who are rainbow people. Um, you are not alone. You probably feel incredibly isolated um, in your school, I imagine it feels very, very scary and my heart goes out to you. I'm really happy to provide my email address as well um, so that you can get in touch with both of us. And um, I'd also love to send through a number of resources that you might be interested um, to read and to watch and listen and learn and just feel a little bit less alone. I can promise you that there are other people out there like you and you are perfect and loved and um, we are here ready to support you. Thank you for calling in. Um, I'm so pleased that you're with us tonight and I hope that some of the things that, that we've just mentioned just now um, touch you and can make you feel a little bit less alone right now. I just wanna add on what Tane has said as well. Um, I remember being in high school and going through a tough time while my school wasn't Christian. I was bullied about my sexuality and um, it's not an easy journey and I can't imagine what you and your friends are going through is easy, but I just want you to see like us now as adults, like it's okay. You find your community. There are people that love you and care about you and while this time is extremely difficult, I promise you it will get better. And like, I hope that you listen to everything that Tane just said. We're gonna send you those and we're contactable. We'll give you our email addresses. We're here for you. Um, don't feel alone. That, that's all I, I want you to know. Um, aroha to you. I would also say the strength that you have demonstrated so far to be um, calling in bravely tonight, but also to have found this webinar um, shows me that you have incredible resilience. Um, and you, you mentioned your other rainbow friends, which makes me very, very happy. Um, there is hope for you, there is support. Um, you have phenomenal coping tactics and you are loved and we are here for you. Totally. Thanks so much, guys. I'm gonna go offline and just check in. Um, David, over to you to ask that next question. Alex, great questions. Thanks, peeps, I'll be back. Yep. Um, so Alex Griffiths um, asked us on the chat, um, not so much specifically rainbow community focus per se, but um, on the political and governmental level, how do you think we could begin to better include marginalized voices in policy decisions? Really good um, question. Um, yeah, you can give a bit of tips. I love that you're giving us easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Anna. Can you, can you repeat the question again, please? Sorry. I, uh, I, he said, I, yeah, well. he said, on the political and governmental level, how do you think we could begin to better include marginalized voices in policy decisions? 
I am also wondering if from the wording of that question, that isn't specifically just for rainbow communities, but perhaps broader, more diverse communities yep. as well. Yeah, yeah. I think honestly, and this is from my own experience, it's about having us in those spaces um, to make sure that the various issues that we care about um, are being put forward. Um, and I'll take that right back to even some of the things that we're seeing in the media at the moment around targeted admission schemes, around racism and things like that. Um, it, these are important because it helps our communities have, um, how do I want to say the words? It's about giving us more of a platform to ensure that we are there and are the ones writing these stories. It's, it's for us. What's that thing? You know, it was like, no, <laughs> oh, that thing. No, like by us, for us, or, you know, no. <laughs> I'm not saying that well. <laughs> what I mean to say is. By like, us, not about us, maybe? That kind of yeah, sentiment? Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Um, but like, for example, here at the commission, um, I, obviously we were. Nothing at, about us without us. Kia ora. That, thank you. That's Luca. it. Thank Sorry. you. That's what I was um, trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because again, like, what's the point of having these policies or these people who are in politics and government? Yes. If they yes. are just writing things that don't actually have our voice in it. It's all very nice and meaningful. But again, it goes back to that participation and um, ensuring that we're part of the decision-making processes because that makes a heck of a difference. That's um, right. Yeah. And actually, nothing about us without us is, it does, isn't just a catchy slogan. We're not making this up. This is actually a human rights obligation that our governments have. They must involve us in decisions which affect our lives. And yeah, again, it, that these are our human rights. Yeah. They are basic human rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, you know, those most at risk, if we bring it back, back to climate change just for a moment, those most at risk are, of the effects of climate change are the already at risk groups. They are our older people, people with disabilities, indigenous minorities, rainbow people, absolutely. That's why we're here tonight. Um, many of our minorities are on the margins and they, um, if, if, we talk, if we talk about particular um, climate, uh, climate disasters, there is an, a, a vulnerability before the disaster, certainly during the disaster and post disaster as well. And if we are not named in those um, disaster relief organizations policies, then how can we ever be expected to be meaningfully catered for, um, uh, spoken to, communicated with in ways that meet our needs? It's, um, it's, it's very unlikely. Yeah. Mm. Cool. Um, another question we have here um, from Anna. Following on from Lucas Query, I would like in I will be interested to hear more, a bit more Correro on the intersection between the different spaces known as rainbow. For example, queer rights and indigenous rights. I have noticed people who identif identities, identif I assume you would like to say, identify as intersex. Both those categories often seem to be very motivated to participate in activism of all kinds. Although, as Luca notes, they are often more at risk too, um, due to impacts of post-colonial legal systems on indigenous groups. I'm interested in whether this is a common experience for people who have intersecting minority identities. Amnesty is reaching out a lot, but what else can we do to encourage such advocates to join us along their path? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can repeat the question if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Um, it involves a lot of <laughs> thinking. There. Yeah, that's a really chewy question, but a fantastic one. Thank you. I, I can I just briefly share something first? Yeah. Yeah. Go. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about the conversation that we were having um, over the weekend about um, one way to to involve people more we thought could be for 
perhaps organizations and groups to partner with each other. So maybe if there are um, uh, climate justice kind of organizations, they may wish to get in touch with some of the organizations that we, we named before, maybe Inside Out, Rainbow Youth, um, Gender Minorities, Aotearoa, maybe just like start to build those relationships, do some whakawhanaungatanga with each other and upskill each other so that our rainbow groups can improve on their um, knowledge around climate change and climate justice and our climate groups can learn a bit more and meaningfully include us in their activities and their mahi. Um, we thought that could be a way to, yeah, to build some bridges, um, strengthen our movements because as we've said, it is all the same fight. Um, and I love that you pointed out um, people to, in, in minority groups often tend to be very motivated to participate in activism. And I've certainly noticed that myself and many rainbow and trans spaces too. Yeah, you answered that really well. Oh. I, <laughs> I don't think I can add any more to that, Anna. <laughs> okay. There is um, a question from Alex again, um, not about, it's more for Amnesty that says, out of interest, are there projects, spaces, events that Amnesty International have for Rainbow Use to engage with? If so, do you have any links, contacts for this? Um, uh, yes, we have um, revenue use in our membership. Um, everybody's welcome to join our groups, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna post on the chat um, the link to join our Amnesty community where um, a volunteer organizer will contact you and brief you more about activities that the groups are doing. But also we attend other events organized by um, Rainbow, like the Rainbow Marches in Oakland or Wellington as well. So we all, we have a lot of volunteers that are in more than one organization as well. Um, maybe Maggie wants to add something more on what I just said, um, because she is a community manager. You're lucky that you have a community man manager in the, in the call. Yeah, look, I'd have to say we have many campaigns that we run, which take a, a, a rainbow focus. Some of them are very public and some of them are very behind the scenes because it would not be safe for rainbow people to be publicly uh, campaigned on behalf of by Amnesty in countries around the world. So um, just to draw the link between, again, climate justice advocates and rainbow rights advocates, the two most, the two most at risk human rights defenders are rainbow rights advocates and environmental advocates. So we tend to campaign very much on behalf of those individuals to ensure that we keep them safe or if they are targeted to bring the perpetrators to justice. So more of a campaign rather than spaces, but loved, love to have a rainbow network if, if people on this call would like to join with Amnesty to deliver on that. Sign me up. Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do you want to talk about? So we, you're seven minutes <laughs> past your time, and I've said we'll oh. keep it going till the questions come. Okay. Uh, until the questions stop, but I, I dobbed you in without asking you, so I just want to check that you're okay if, if we go a little longer. Um, we have one from Luca. Um, on the point of this all being the same fight, because yes, do you have any advice in terms of how to talk to people about this who might not quite be there yet with their understanding? It's about educating yeah it is it is about educating them and there's different ways to do that i mean i have people and i have friends and even family who aren't quite there with some thinking and so i used to get when i was younger i used to get really angry and be like this is the reason why but um so now i just try to like myself i'll send them helpful articles or frame it as a way where it if I talk about an issue, for example, like kind of make it really personal or, or kind of like, well, how would you feel if X, Y, Z happened to you? Again, I don't think there's a right way to do that. It's about 
or what resources do you have? So, and when I say resources, it could be a link to something like a video or an article, or maybe having a corridor um, through like a local community group, or you know, people who you know who might be really skilled in these areas, just to have that conversation. And I think, you know, the thing is, is when you're going to talk to people who might uh, might not be all the way there and they're thinking we have to remember sometimes as hard as it is like to think about how confronting that might be from their position you know when you are talking about a lot of these big i uh, not ideas but a lot of these concepts that are unfamiliar and it's because it's different and they don't know something other so it's about um you know breaking down the walls i i think and at the end of the day people are only humans and Fucker for knowing a tongue, so that's relationships between people are really important. So, yeah, just I, I guess that's the only kind of advice I could give to that, and that we all can play different roles in how we do that. That's like I like to have yarns, so <laughs> I like to talk to people, and you know, you don't have to ag it's like that agree to disagree kind of thing, but like continuously sparking that conversation and having these types of talks. Well, you might not be able to change the world. It's, um, you know, slowly over time, hopefully, the more you have these kinds of talks that somebody begins to kind of get it. And then they go and spark change within something else and be like, oh, did you know X, Y, Z about this issue? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm babbling again. Um, but no, yeah. That was, that was great. And I was just going to kind of um, add on to that, but I can see Maggie's already written a bit of that as um, I was just going to say, see if you can find common ground and just start from there. Um, I think it's a really important point that you note that um, different experiences, um, education, ideologies perhaps mean that we can end up um, kind of being being at um, what's the word loggerhead. That's probably not, I can't. I don't know. Uh, at heads. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, against each other in, in an oppositional way. And I don't think that it has to get to that stage. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think that a lot of, well, we, we know that a lot of fear is based in ignorance, right? And when we don't know what we, when we don't know people from a particular group maybe, or when we are afraid of something, it's often because we don't understand it. Um, and this is not necessarily safe to do in all circumstances, but meeting people who are different to you, who might be part of a certain population group can help to break down some of that stigma and misunderstanding um, and provide a bit of education when you realize that we're all just human, eh? It's exactly it. Yeah, that, that principle and that, um, yeah, that fundamental human rights principle of dignity and, um, you know, being able, being who we are, you know, we are who we say we are, that self-determination. And more importantly, one thing that I have learned in so many different uh, forums that I've spoken at or uh, different people is food. Food oh, brings people together. Like, you know, you rumbling. could have the most like different views, but honestly, Kai brings it back. Like I've heard about like- uh, Look like, at all the reactions yeah. you're getting. <laughs> exactly. But I've heard conversations where um, difficult like issues around indigenous issues and you know United Nations kind of platforms and what broke the ice was the food and um, <laughs> having uncomfortable conversations but it helps like it does yeah. <laughs> doesn't have to be like a full course meal but yeah some <laughs> and, and food also sparks memories and um, situations with people so it that common it's an that equalizer common, yeah, eh? yeah. finding that common balance yeah, yeah. okay so I, I get a sense that people are thinking about dinner right now I, I know <laughs> that Anna has asked one question um, I'll take one other question after Anna's because you guys have been great but you you do need to go and get some kai down here um, so Anna has said she's based in Christchurch in terms of terms of not quite there yet, it does often seem down here as if our local Tangata Whenua are not as heavily engaged with climate justice action as yet, and also are not so open to any approaches by amnesty around human rights actions in general. Any thoughts? 
that is a very great question. That must be and one Ngaitahu. Ngaitahu, yeah. right? Mm. And what I will say to that is um I'm not gonna speak for other Māori. <laughs> yeah. But the my first point of call would be to try and organize a hui or something with them to talk about what matters to them because it might seem that way, but that maybe they have their own tikanga practices that they're carrying out to, you know, look after their environment. There's there's probably something that they are doing. And um, you know, we manaki people, Māori. That's that's what we like to do. And that's um embracing everybody and um you know i think another thing to remember about our maori whanau is especially where i'm from because we've had so many things happen to us um mm. sometimes we do have those exteriors up but it's only for protection because we're so used to being take take yeah. take yeah. but again um i would just start that corridor it might not be an easy one but it might lead to something great and again it's the what was it we were saying before building that common bridge together mm. absolutely something um if i may add on to that go. um one of our colleagues um andre taught me that we come with deep humility and we never come empty-handed and i think your point about food is a great one um and and looking for that that common ground so that there's um can be respectful, inclusive discussion. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up there with that one comment of my own that uh, Tanga de Whenua and Christchurch have been everywhere as part of the rebuild and everywhere as part of the healing process with, uh, with uh, the Christchurch mosque um, killings and um, maybe just slightly busy elsewhere, but. Yeah, I mean, hmm. And there's that whole issue around uh, participation. And, and now we're finding that because there's so many different things happening, it's hard for us to be everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, do keep that in mind. You, you know, all, and all I can see is heaps of thanks and araha coming your way, Charm and Tane. Thank you so much. We'll, this is, we do record this. I'll get those messages of thanks to you. Thank you for your insights and honesty. Thank you for your laughter and your love. Another great session. Um, so honoured that you um, said yes to Amnesty International. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you for a great session. One more in this series. Thanks for being part of it and adding your great coral rose to those questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Sure, to everyone. Sure. The karakia. I can't hear it. Can you? Oh, we do it. Do we? Yeah. 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 Kete pai. Kia tau te rangi marie, ki runga i a tātou katoa. Ruia, 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 ruia. Ruia ki runga, ruia ki raro. Ruia ki waho, ruia ki roto. Ruia ki uta, ruia ki tai. Huana ki te rangi, turuana ki nuku. Nā, koa tau, koa mau, koa ea, tihe wā, mauri ora. Ki ora. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Maggie and David. Thanks, Charm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for Maria, for good Maria. night. Maria.